one of the greatest barriers that job creation has today is regulatory uncertainty. Small businesses already bear a heavy regulatory burden. Overreaching new proposed regulations are having a chilling effect, prolonging the economic downturn that we are experiencing in our country. Today we will examine the U.S. Department of Agriculture's proposed Grain Inspection, Packers and Stockyards Administration, or the GIPSA rule, and the potential ramifications it will have on America's small businesses. I would like to extend special thanks to each of our witnesses here today uh, for taking the time out of your busy schedules uh, to be here. And I'd like to, uh, like to especially thank the folks from the USDA and Under Secretary Avalos for being here. I also want to extend a warm welcome to Robbie Lavalley, a constituent of mine from Hotchkiss, Colorado, who we will hear testimony for, from later, along with other representatives for small businesses within the beef, pork, and poultry industries. Just over a year ago, the USDA announced a proposed rule that would significantly alter livestock marketing practices and further inject the government into small businesses' marketing and business decisions. If implemented as proposed, this overreaching new rule would hurt thousands of small businesses in the livestock industry and cost our country thousands of jobs. The GIPSA rule would create uncertainty for livestock producers and open the door for frivol frivolous lawsuits based on nothing more than accusations of competitive injury. Further, although the rule was prompted by the 2008 Farm Bill, I believe what was proposed by the USDA went far beyond the intent of Congress. The proposed rule has raised concerns for many in the agricultural community. During the public comment period, the USDA received more than 61,000 comments from stakeholders in the beef, pork, and poultry industries. Despite the proposed rule's potential for having far-reaching impacts on small businesses, no comprehensive cost-benefit analysis was performed. Chairman Graves and I found the USDA's disregard for the Regulatory Flexibility Act extremely troubling. As a result, last month we sent a letter to the USDA Secretary, Secretary Tom Vislak, expressing our concerns and calling for, among other things, a revised regulatory flexibility analysis to ensure that the USDA fully understands the private sector costs of regulations in its imposing uh, these new rules on small businesses. Independent studies estimate that the proposed rule would deal a $1.5 billion blow to our nation's economy and directly cause a loss of 23,000 jobs. Clearly, our country cannot afford further economic injury of this magnitude. I look forward to hearing from our witnesses as they provide testimony and seek to prevent regulatory injuries that will likely result by implementation of, exist of the existing proposed rule. I also look forward to hearing from Under Secretary Avalos on the current status of the proposed rule. It is my hope that if the USDA moves forward on the proposed rule, it will do so only after significantly revising the rule to address the concerns raised here today and to incorporate the suggestions from those who commented on the rule. I would also encourage the USDA to consider and include in the record the letter of Chairman Graves that Chairman Graves and I sent to Secretary Veslek on June 13th and address the inadequacies of the agency's initial regulatory flexibility analysis and the potential ramifications on small businesses. Again, I would like to thank all of you for taking the time to be here today, and I will now yield to Ranking Member Kretz for his opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, Mr. Secretary, Mr. Christian. Thank you for being here. Uh, over the past 60 years, technological improvements and scientific breakthroughs have enabled our farms to become the most productive in the world. However, the dramatic expansion of industrial agriculture has also made it increasingly challenging for small family farms to thrive. One area that has factored into this trend has been consolidation and vertical integration of the meat and poultry industry. Compared to 20 years ago, the cattle industry is roughly 40 percent more concentrated. The modern poultry industry is 67 percent more concentrated than two decades ago. These trends have profoundly affected how small farms operate. As industry consolidation reduced the number of outlets for agricultural products, many family farms have shifted toward contract production. In addition, market forces have strained the bottom line of many farmers. Congress recognized this and took steps to address these concerns in the 2008 Farm Bill. That measure contains provisions 
to improve marketing practices, including new rules for production contracts. The bill required the Grain Inspection, Packers, and Stockyards Administration, GYPSA, to define anti-competitive practices with the goal of improving oversight and compliance. Last June, GYPSA published its proposed rule intended to bring transparency to the industry and help small family farms compete. Today we will examine how effective this proposal is in restoring a competitive balance to the meat and poultry industries. The subcommittee will also be investigating the economic costs on small and medium-sized farms. I look forward to any suggestions our witnesses may have for improving the regulation before the USDA f issues its final rule. While the goal of the rulemaking is to help level the playing field, it is imperative that USDA properly weigh any adverse economic impact and explore less burdensome alternatives. I am confident after this hearing the USDA will continue to proceed in a transparent manner that allows public comments to the proposal as well as the pending economic analysis. This input must be fully considered before a final rule is, is issued. Independent family farms play a vital role in rural, rural ec economies. In addition to providing jobs, family farmers also help support small businesses by purchasing goods and services within their communities. Without them, rural areas are left with higher rates of unemployment and little opportunity for economic growth. It is vitally important that firms who will be directly impacted by the changes are heard. In advance of the testimony, I want to thank all the witnesses who traveled here today, including Bob Junk from uh, my congressional district, uh, for their participation and insights into this important topic. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you, Ranking Member Kretz. And uh, I would ask if committee members have a statement that they submit it for the record. And, uh, gentlemen, you are probably familiar with it, but if I may take a moment to explain our lighting system. Uh, you will have five minutes for your testimony. Uh, when the light turns yellow, you have one minute left, and uh, if you exceed that a little bit, if you would wrap up your comments as quickly as possible and we can proceed on with questions from the committee, we would appreciate it. Uh, our first panel uh, today, we will hear testimony from the Honorable Edward Avalos, uh, Under Secretary for Marketing and Regulatory Programs for the USDA. And uh, Ms. Secretary, I want to certainly uh, let you know that we do appreciate your having reached out to our office and I know the other members as well. Uh, Mr. Avalos provides leadership and oversight for the Animal and Plant Health Inspection Services, which addresses animal and plant pests and diseases. The Agricultural Marketing Service, which provides standardization, testing, and marketing of commodities and specialty crops and grain inspection. Packers and Stockyard Administration, which promotes marketing of livestock, cereals, and meats, as well as fair trade practices. Mr. Avalos grew up in a family farm in Melissa Valley of southern New Mexico. And Mr. Avalos is joined by Mr. Alan Christian, uh, Deputy Administrator for at Grain Inspection, Packers, and Stockyards Administration, GYPSA. And I'd like to thank both of you gentlemen for taking the time to be here today. Uh, Mr. Avalos, if you would uh, begin with your testimony. Thank you. Chairman Tipton, Ranking Member Critz, members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today to discuss the proposed rule issued by the Grain Inspection Packers and Stockyards Administration, better known as GYPSA, on June 22, 2010. While I am looking forward to getting into the important uh, small business perspectives from members of this committee, I am limited by the Administrative Procedures Act and USDA's ex parte guidelines of what I can discuss at this stage of the rulemaking. Before I talk about the proposed rule, let me provide some context. It is very appropriate for the Small Business Committee to decide to focus on this hearing a small business in the livestock and poultry industries. The vast majority of farmers in general, specifically livestock and poultry producers, are small businesses. There are currently 70,000 hog producers in this country, almost a million cattle ranchers in the country, and nearly 20,000 poultry growers. The majority of these individuals are family-owned small businesses. I think the point that farmers, ranchers, livestock producers, poultry growers and are small businesses is important to note. As you all know, small businesses are the lifeblood of our economy and where jobs are created and where new ideas are developed. The Secretary and I have long recognized the importance of farmers, ranchers and producers to rural communities. Our livestock and poultry producers benefit rural communities because they also support other small 
local businesses, such as the local hardware store, the feed store, uh, local restaurants, the local tractor farm implement dealers. A primary mission of GYPSA, and in particular Packer Stockyards program, is to make sure that the marketplace is fair and transparent, ensuring small businesses get a fair shake. Decades before the Small Business Administration was formed, and the importance of small business was really fully recognized. The predecessor of GYPSA was created by Congress through the Packers and Stockyards Act in 1921. This was largely done to protect small businesses, that is, livestock producers and ranchers, against abuses of market power by large meat packers. The Packers and Stockyards Act, which is the basis for GYPSA's enforcement authority in the livestock and poultry industry, is 90 years old this year. These industries have changed dramatically over time. For example, stockyards are virtually non-existent today. This longevity means the regulations in the Act itself need to be updated periodically. Congress realized this in the 2008 Farm Bill by making some changes in the Act and directing USDA to propose specific regulations. Combined with a handful of additional areas that USDA felt deserved closer attention, needed input from stakeholders. This was the genesis of the rulemaking that is the subject of this hearing today. The purpose of the proposed rule was to make the markets more fair and transparent, which was intended to benefit livestock producers and poultry growers, the vast majority of which are family-owned businesses. This is in no way to minimize concerns about potential unintended consequences of the proposed rule, either generally or related to small businesses. For example, I know there are various concerns that were raised about the rule hindering value-added and other market activities. I want to make clear to you, Mr. Chairman and the committee, that our intent and intent of the Secretary and myself we are very strong supporters of these marketing arrangements, these arrangements that often provide premiums to farmers and ranchers at the same time meet consumer demand. We received over 60, 61,000 comments. These comments were comprehensive, thoughtful, and educational. We view these comments as tools that will guide us on our path to make the appropriate needed reforms. It is important to us to have a workable and common sense rule. These comments will assist the, assist the Department to determine if all factors have been properly considered. The comments will also aid us to develop a more rigorous cost-benefit analysis such as, and, and uh, other related analysis, such as a small business analysis. While it, would be, while it would not be appropriate to go into detail and specific modifications, I can assure you that the Department will take careful account of the public comments. We ask that everyone have patience as we carefully work through the comments, and we ask that we not prejudge the outcome. Thank you again for the opportunity to appear before you today to talk about this proposed rule and share our support for small businesses in rural America. I welcome your questions and your comments. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. And uh, we will now proceed with the uh, questioning for uh, Secretary Avalos. And uh, I will begin. And uh, I think that is important to probably note, and I think you brought up a very important word in intent. Uh, you know, we have seen uh, some good cooperative work uh, with the USDA, of course. And uh, I am encouraged to hear that uh, you are taking into consideration uh, the 61,000 comments uh, that came into play. Uh, particularly as it gets down to some of the cost-benefit analysis. Uh, Ms. Secretary, in recent testimony before the Senate Agricultural Committee, the USDA uh, Chief Economist Joe Glover stated that uh, the Department's economic analysis of the rule uh, is difficult given how the regulations could affect behavior by packers and interrogators uh, and how they do business. Given that the Department has now admitted that the rule would have a significant economic impact, Will the findings of the economic analysis result in the Department undertaking a new regulatory flexibility analysis? 
Uh, Congressman, first I want to, or I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman, first I, I, I want to say that this administration uh, is strongly committed to helping small business, and we strongly support um, transparency, fairness, and equity in the marketplace. This is really, really important to us. Uh, the comments that we received on the proposed rule, uh, they, they, they bring up some of these, these concerns that you just talked about on, on the uh, small business analysis that Dr. Glover was talking about. And I, I guess, once again, what I'm asking is that we have patience, let the time-tested rulemaking process continue, and I can assure you that we are going to listen to these comments, the comments on the cost benefit analysis that was in the proposed rule, the comments that were on the, 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 the business, small business analysis. And I can assure you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, that Dr. Glauber, our chief economist, will have, well, first of all, he will lead the team to develop the cost benefit analysis. But this is important, he will have considerable input on how this impacts small business. Uh, one question, I guess, that I'm, I'm curious about, Mr. Secretary, is, is once we've taken into consideration uh, those 61,000 comments and, and we have that patience, uh, before the rule goes final, uh, will there be a, a general review coming back uh, to, to Congress? Okay. Uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, um, th this process has really been tedious, and it's, it's, it's a new process for me. Coming from New Mexico, I've never been exposed to something like this, and, and sometimes uh, you, know, you really try your patience. But we received all these comments, okay, and then we summarized them, and now we put them in category as to how they impact on specific provisions of the proposed rule. And uh, anyway, having done all that, we're now looking at at options, at alternatives. We are looking at possible modifications. And I just don't want to prejudge the rulemaking process. So I can't tell you, you know, what, what, what the end product is going to be. Mm -hmm. okay, I, I, I can't tell you, uh, you know, what kind of form the end product will have, and I can't tell you if we are going to have additional comments or not. Uh, you know, as mentioned in the comments from Chairman Graves and myself, uh, the Department's information gathering on small businesses uh, appeared to be uh, inadequate. What procedures will the Department have in place uh, to better measure, number one, the scope of small businesses potentially being impacted and how these businesses uh, would be impacted compared to their larger rivals? Um, Mr. Chairman, once again, I. Uh, were, you, were you making reference to the letter that came into the Secretary? Yes, sir. Well, well Mr. Chairman, first of all, I want to, well, to, to acknowledge and, and to appreciate the considerable thought and effort that was put into the letter. Uh, this, this was really important. But um, it did have some specific requests and recommendations, and due to the Administrative Procedures Act, I can't discuss right now. But I can, I can tell you this. Uh, most of the requests that were in the letter uh, also came up in the comments on the rule and are being considered. Uh, I can also tell you that these concerns requests are on my mind because of how they impact on small businesses, mm -hmm. how they impact on growers and producers all over the country. And Maybe I should share a story with you, Mr. Chairman. I, um, the reason it's on my mind, what's important to me, I, um, in the past, worked a lot with the livestock industry, did a lot of work to export livestock into Mexico, and I still have friends all over the United States. And in particular, I had a, an old friend from, of all places, from Tulia, Texas. They called me up about the proposed rule. And I told him, well, you know, I can't talk about it. But I, I, t I told him one thing. He was concerned about his operation, how he was getting a premium for his cattle. Small operator, 300 mother cows, uh, part owner of a feedlot. But because of the quality of his cattle, he got a premium. 
and he was concerned about losing that premium. So I told him, just like I said in my opening statement, Secretary Vilsack and I strongly support um, value added. We strongly support marketing arrangements, strongly support premiums to producers that produce high quality cattle. So anyway, um, going, back, going back to your question, Congressman, Mr. Chairman, no option is being ruled out. So we are really focused on the issues and concerns. Uh, we are taking these comments very serious. And I can assure you that at the end of the day, uh, we will fully comply with the provisions of the Farm Bill, the provisions of Pack and Stockyards Act, Administrative Procedures Act, and the Regulatory Flexibility Act. Uh, Ms. Travel, you and I are probably two of the only people in this room that know where Tulia, Texas actually is. <laughs> and, uh, you know, uh, we, we come from, from rural, rural America. Uh, I'm out of Colorado, and uh, we're, we're actually neighbors pretty close. Uh, but during a uh, recent Ag Committee subcommittee uh, meeting, you had stated that uh, you wanted to repopulate rural America as a result of the implementation of the proposed rule. And uh, as I mentioned in my statement, independent studies estimate that the proposed rule would deal a uh, $1.5 billion blow to our nation's economy and directly cause the loss of about 23,000 jobs. Uh, the more, majority of these job losses uh, will be found, obviously, in rural America, given the nature of this. And how is this going to help really repopulate uh, rural America? Mr. Chairman, I, I appreciate those comments because they, rural America is very important not only to me but to Secretary Vilsack and to the administration. You know, this administration has made revitalizing rural America a priority, keeping farmers and ranchers on the farm and on the ranch a priority. Um, the intent of this proposed rule was to maintain fairness, transparency, equ equity in the marketplace. Uh, the intent was not to hurt producers. Um, once again, I will refer back to the 60,000 plus comments that we received. Um, a lot of these concerns were raised in the comments. And again, we are taking these comments very serious. Uh, we are not leaving out any options. And as we move forward, um, the comments will guide us. Okay. Uh, you know, under the proposed rule, it will be necessary for small packers to determine and document uh, the benefits of contractual terms in order to satisfy the record uh, re keeping requirements uh, that are mandated. Is that correct? Mr. Chairman, I want to make sure we get a correct answer to you, so I'm going to defer to Mr. Christian. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. The, uh, I think the intent of, uh, of the rule was to uh, provide uh, a fair and uh, transparent market for uh, producers, and in particular small producers, that uh, over the years we have heard from don't feel that they have uh, the same access uh, to those markets as some of the larger producers. And so the intent of that provision and others, you know, similar to it, was to uh, provide that uh, level playing field, if you will, and some transparency so they know uh, what type of uh, mechanisms or, or marketing arrangements are available uh, for them. Okay. Well, when we are talking about those calculations, uh, to, to whom are, are the benefits uh, to be calculated? The packers, producers, consumers? What is kind of the matrix? Uh, I beg your pardon, the, Mr. Chairman. The On that, in terms of, in terms of who are the benefits when we are talking about when those are going to be calculated out? Are the benefits going to be to the packer, the consumers, the producers? In the cost-benefit analysis? Yes. Well, I think that it varies depending on, you know, the particular provision. And uh, Dr. Glauber, you know, with the Chief Economist's Office is, in fact, um, you know, as we speak, undertaking the, uh, the cost-benefit analysis for the, uh, for the rule based on the comments that we received. I just have one final uh, question here. Has GIPSA considered uh, the cost for a small packer to engage separate packer buyers for each auction barn uh, with which it currently does business? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I think that is probably getting into the specifics mm -hmm. of the rule. 
And but I do know that that's been brought up in the comments. And once again, I'm asking for your patience and the patience of the committee and the stakeholders to, to let this rulemaking process continue and let us focus on these issues and concerns that were brought up um, in the comments and let us address them. Uh, and I can assure you that at, at the end, uh, the final product, whatever form it is, will take into consideration all these very important comments that we have received. Uh, thank you, gentlemen. I would like to now yield Ranking Member Kritz uh, for his question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Secretary, as, as you mentioned in your statement and as you have been de like detailing, there has been a consolidation in um, uh, livestock, there has been a consolidation in uh, pork and in poultry uh, over the last 10 to 20 years. Can you, and I guess in a, in a way of explanation, I am new to this process, uh, just elected last year, so I am trying to get up to speed as much as possible. I have written to this, uh, the Secretary, uh, Secretary Vilsack about uh, uh, the economic impact of the, rule, of the rule. Can you detail what prompted initially this uh, analysis for GYPSA and then tell me about a timeline going forward as well? Okay. Um, Congressman, Mr. Chairman. Your question was on what prompted the cost-benefit analysis? Yeah. No, no. What? With the consolidation, and, and I guess going further, there is a lot of talk about loss of jobs that GYPSA will uh, impart. My concern is in you know, my part of the world, I have a lot of small farmers. So uh, what I am asking is what has been the impact on small farmers because of this consolidation over the years that prompt this, prompted uh, this revisit, revisiting of GYPSA? Uh, Congressman, as I mentioned in the opening statement, the Packers and Stockyards Act is 90 years old. Right. And um, I'll go back to advice I received from my dad a long time ago when I was just a young man and we moved. <laughs> you appreciate this, Mr. Chairman. We moved from the farm to town, to the city. And I, I wasn't very happy. And my dad sat me down and said, Look, son, in this world, Everything is always changing. Nothing ever stays the same. You need to adjust to survive. I think this applies with the Packers Stockyards Act. It's 90 years old. Uh, the industry has changed tremendously in 90 years. And we're having to make adjustments to the regulations to keep up with the industry, to address the needs of the industry, whether it be the packer or the producer. So, so anyway, um, this, this need for change, for modification, is really what prompted these, these changes to, to, to the Act, to the law. And I am going to, just to make sure we answer your question, Congressman, I want to defer to Mr. Christian. Maybe he can help me out a little bit. Okay. Yeah, Congressman, I think uh, you know, if you look over the last, say, 20 years, you go back to the 90s, there has been, a, as you mentioned, a very significant decrease in the number of, of uh, farmers. Uh, if you look at you know cattle, you're going from say 1.2 uh, million to under a million. You've got uh, 250,000 hog producers. Now you're down to around you know, under 70,000. And uh, even livestock markets, you're going from about 1,800 livestock markets now down to about 1,200 livestock markets. And I'm sure there's many factors that have contributed to that decline, but one of the things that we hear all the time from small farmers and really the smallest of small business is that they can't compete in the marketplace. I mean, we've heard from small poultry growers that uh, they've invested a substantial amount of money, you know, 500000 to a million dollars, and uh, they've got a contract that they've entered into freely to raise poultry for a large integrator. And then after a short period of time, the integrator comes back and changes their contract, maybe from a three-year contract to a flock-to-flock -flock contract. And the grower at that point really is under a contract of adhesion and has no ability to then bargain. So we've heard those kind of issues from, from small growers, from small hog producers. I mean, we've heard that there are cost-plus contracts in the industry. There are ledger contracts in the industry. 
but a lot of these contracts that provide some type of financial protection are available to the large producers and are not available, even if the small producer can meet those terms, are not available to that person. So we have taken you know, those concerns into account as we have developed this proposed rule, and the intent of the rule is then to provide at least a more transparent marketplace and a fairer marketplace where the small producers can at least see what is available and have an opportunity then to compete for those marketing uh, arrangements. So we are looking to become more transparent to give the small producers a seat at the table if, and, and, and I guess a, way, a, a fair chance to compete for contracts. Um, and this comes back to, I think, the letter that uh, uh, the Chairman and, and Chairman Graves had sent and, and that I had talked about actually in a letter that I sent last year about the economic impact. And, you know, obviously in this country we like everything as cheap as possible. Uh, and I am assuming that with vertical integration it keeps the price compressed, which uh, dealing in the world of subcontracting, I know that it is the guy at the bottom of the rung that usually fills the pinch the hardest. Um, now, I don't know from your seat if you have seen, uh, you talked about the loss of uh, farming, farms, uh, pr small producers over the years. What is the um, uh, time, I guess you could, I am asking, on, uh, we, we, uh, I think we have all asked for an economic impact of what this rule change would do. Where in process are we? with getting an answer on the economic impact. Uh, Congressman, as we all know, the Secretary directed uh, our Chief Economist, Dr. Glauber, to, do, uh, to lead a team of economists at USDA to conduct a very thorough and comprehensive cost-benefit analysis and economic analysis. Um, I don't know exactly where we are in the process. I know that uh, the team has been working very hard on this, and I know that it's taken considerable time because of the extent of the comments, and the comments received on the proposal are, are they're, they're being used as guidance in preparing this, this cost-benefit analysis. So um, I can't I can't give you a timeline as to where we are, but I can tell you that Dr. Glauber and the team are working very hard on this. Okay. Well, and that brings me to to my next question, and, and obviously those of us up here are. We get a two-year contract every two years, so time is very important to us. Um, and um, from the testimony and from the information I received, the comment period ended on November 22nd, which is about 32 weeks ago. Uh, 61,000 comments, eh, one person going through 400 comments a week on a five-day work week could have covered that. So if you have got 10 people, that is only four. So I am curious. Where are we in process? You talked about uh, uh, putting these in silos or categorizing them. How close are we to coming up with some sort of guidance that those of us, and, and obviously being on the Small Business and the Subcommittee on Agriculture, this is extremely important to us because we all represent small producers, but we also live in this large economy that we have to figure out where the balance is. Uh, Congressman, that's, I, I wish I could just give you an answer, but I it's it's a hard question to answer because I, I don't know when we're going to have a final product. Uh, and like I mentioned earlier, we've you know, now, now we've got them. Can you tell me how many people are working on it? I uh, I cannot, but I I can defer to Mr. Christian. He might know how many folks are working on this. Yeah, uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Congressman. The the. Uh, the uh, GIPSA is a very small organization. And, uh, the Packers and Stockyards program is 160 people. Um, uh, the rules that we work on typically receive anywhere from, you know, 20 to you know a couple hundred comments. Uh, we've leveraged people from outside of the agency, with the from the Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service, to help us review these comments. We've been working as hard as we possibly can with the, the few amount of people that we have uh, to, to get this completed. And, and I can assure you, Dr. Glauber, uh, the Chief Economist's Office, is working very diligently to get the cost-benefit analysis completed. 
And I think, you know, that's a key piece. Once we get the cost-benefit analysis, then that gives us, you know, a lot of information uh, to look at the options that are available to, to move forward. So, so are we looking at, now it's been seven months, within a year of the close, November 22nd, 2011, I mean, can you even ballpark it that we're close or we have several months to go? Uh, and I, uh, I, I, don't, I don't mean to be no, no, no. pushy about this, but, you know, it, it, and, and I think the chairman mentioned it, is that uncertainty creates issues for a lot of people. And, you know, if, at least if you know where you are, you know how you can compete or how you can't compete. And I think that this is creating some uncertainty within all mark or all levels of this marketplace. Co Congress, Mr. Chairman, I, I, pre I appreciate that. I wanted to add a little something, then I'll, I'll try to give you a more direct answer. Um, on the comments that we received, you know, they weren't just uh, I'm for the rule, against the rule. The people, the stakeholders that took time and expense to submit their comments, which we greatly, greatly appreciate. Uh, were very comprehensive. They, they uh, gave alternatives, recommendations, options, um, very, very thorough. So it's not a, you just read them and say, this guy's for them, this guy's against them. It's really a very, very time-consuming, thorough process, a very, very important process. Uh, so to, to answer your question on the timeline, um, Fairly soon, we should have a final product. Fairly soon, okay. Fairly that's, soon. That's, well, that's that's. I mean, that's that that's that's hopeful. Uh, it's summer, you know. Uh, we'll, we'll see where that takes us. One one thing um, that, and, and it's something Mr. Christian just mentioned about the size of GYPSA. Now, with this proposed rule, you're talking about a more transparent process, but you're also talking about more enforcement. What does that mean to the, your level of staffing? If you are already a small organization, how do you then populate to do enforcement of some of these issues? And I think the chairman had mentioned about, you know, there is a worry about frivolous lawsuits. And I think if you look across our legal system, I think anyone can find different areas where there is frivolous lawsuits. Uh, hopefully farming would be, uh, and, and livestock would be one of those areas that would be immune to it, but uh, we can't, we are not that lucky. So how is this playing into the size of your operation? Well, I think, uh, you know, obviously uh, uh, implementing new regulations uh, requires an extra effort. Uh, I have a kind of a theory of, I've been working in, in regulatory enforcement for my, about my entire career. I have a theory, you know, everybody's heard of the 80-20 rule, and uh, it sort of applies to enforcement. If you let folks know what the requirements are, about 80 percent will voluntarily comply. About 2 percent will never comply. And so you focus your efforts first on education to get the industry up to that 80 percent, and then you focus your limited you know, resources on enforcement of that 2 percent so you can get the other 18 percent to understand that it would be better to comply than to not comply. Um, and so that's how GYPSA really, or the Packers and Stockyards program is implemented. I mean, we really just spot check. We make sure that people understand what the rules are in the industry the best we can by getting folks out there, by, you know, working with industry. And then we identify the flagrant violators because we, I mean, we can't look over everybody's shoulder and we try to take strong enforcement action against those flagrant violators to set up the deterrence to get that compliance rate up. And one of the areas that is of concern, because our overall goal, our measure, is compliance. If we can get 100 percent or 90-some percent compliance with the Packers and Stockyards Act and the regulations that were promulgated under it, and if it is a good law and if they are good regulations, then we will have done our job. We will have protect, protected livestock producers, livestock sellers. What we found in poultry, with the limited regulations that are in poultry right now, our compliance rate is still down around 67 percent when we are looking at, at contract compliance. And what I think will happen if these rules are promulgated in a way that, that helps 
provide guidance to the industry as to what we consider compliance under an unfair practice or an unreasonable preference, that it will help the industry get that compliance rate up you know, to over 80 percent and help improve the protections then for poultry growers and you know, the small entities that are out there. Okay. Well, Mr. Chairman, I see you have a, a, actually a, a full slate of, uh, of folks on your side, so I will yield back so that they can get to their questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I would now like to recognize um, Mr. Bartlett for his questions. Thank you very much. Mr. Christian, would you uh, tell us why our small businesses and our farmers think that they are going to be uh, hurt by this proposed rule? And after you have uh, done that, then I would like the Secretary to tell us why they are wrong. Well, Congressman, uh, I, I think, you know, to look at the response that we have gotten to the proposed rule, the 61,000 comments, will give you an idea of how people feel about the rule and how they feel. But how do they think it is going to hurt them? What do they think it is going to do to them? Well, I mean, looking at the comments, there is a wide range of issues that different entities of different sizes have. Tell us some of those, if you would. To, would you like me to reiterate what some of the comments have indicated? Yeah, I'm sure you can categorize them, and you know, just a few of the of the. Uh, We've received the, the biggest uh, plurality of hits. Well. In the rulemaking process, the, the number of comments aren't necessarily as relevant as the, the substantive nature of the comment. And so, I mean, in terms of numbers, we really received a lot of postcards. We received a lot of emails. I mean, we received probably. Uh, of the substantive comments, why do they think this rule is going to hurt them? What will it do to them? Well, in terms of um, costs, uh, we have identified in the cost-benefit analysis uh, adjustment costs. We have identified analysis costs. And, uh, uh, you know, those were identified and expounded on in, in the uh, comments that we received. In fact, we asked for in the comments information on cost-benefit and information on uh, the effect on small business, you know, a number of times in our uh, preamble. This is, a, I gather, an unprecedented number of uh, responses. Am I correct? Pretty much unprecedented. For GYPSA? Yes. Uh, for the Packers okay. and Stockyards program. So there must be some real major concerns out there. I'm still having some trouble understanding what those major concerns are. What do they think this rule is going to do to them? Why did 80,000 of them, you say, respond to you? Gee, we think this is a bad idea. Give me just a couple of the reasons that they think this is going to hurt them. So far, you've just given me very generic things that I can't get my teeth into. Well, I mean, there were a little over sixty thousand comments, and uh, they were there were uh, comments for the rule. There were comments opposed to the rule. There were comments uh, suggesting modifications or changes to the rule, and we're considering every single one of those comments seriously as we move forward with the process. Mr. Secretary, can you tell us some of their major concerns and why you think they are wrong, or if they may be right and you are going to fix it? Uh, Congressman, appreciate your persistence, and, and, and I really want to give you a direct answer, but because of uh, the ex parte, I, I can't get into the specifics of the proposed rule. But I can give you a perspective coming from the countryside, working with farmers and ranchers all my life. This is um, a proposed rule, something so different, I haven't had a change in this law in 90 years at this magnitude. So there's, there's concern. Uh, there's concern just because there's a new regulation coming from the government. They're concerned about their impact on their livelihood, on their farm and ranch operation, the future of their kids. So once again, you know, I can't give you the specifics that you can put your teeth in, but I can assure you, Congressman, that these comments that we received, um, their concerns are expressed in those comments, and we are taking those comments very serious. 
I was like, I'm still having trouble understanding what their major concerns with the, there must have been enough specifics in your uh, announcement of the, this proposed rule that, that really stirred them up. And I'm having trouble understanding what those specifics were, that they became so agitated you got, what, more than 50,000 responses? Uh, Congressman, I, I wouldn't say they became agitated, because I can't tell you this. Of the comments, and, and, I, and I want to, to make sure that the committee, Mr. Chairman, committee knows that I did take time to read some of these comments. I promised, uh, there's a gentleman here from NCBA that I visited with earlier, I promised the then president of NCBA that I would read their comments, and I did. And very thorough, very comprehensive, and very, it's pretty tough reading, okay? Um, and I also read some comments from some of the other groups that came in, and, and, and it's, it's tough reading. But, but uh, they're, they're not agitated. It's just something that's so different, so new, and they want to make sure that they understand what's being proposed. So they're, they're, they're asking questions, they're, they're, they're supplying alternatives, options. But keep in mind also, Congressman, that not everyone was upset or agitated. A lot of people were really pleased that these changes were being proposed. So, so it, it's, a, it, it's, a, it's a group of, uh, of stakeholders that submitted some very thorough comments and, and made some very good recommendations, and I'll leave it at that. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. King. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I do thank the witnesses. And, Mr. Secretary, I appreciate your demeanor here. And a little about your background is interesting to me um, that growing up in the country and having to make that adjustment, I think that was an interesting narrative. But can you just give me a few seconds on what, that, what the family farmer ranch operation was like? Do you have a family there, brothers and sisters also you grew up with, and you all had to be relocated to the city? And uh, Congressman, I can. You know, I've always said that I grew up on a family farm, but I usually don't get the opportunity to explain the rest of the story. That family farm was not my family's farm. We were the labor on that farm. Now, I had relatives that owned farms nearby, but my dad was injured in an accident, a tractor accident on the farm, and we had to relocate to the city. And it's really, really tough, Congressman, when you grow up as a little kid. You run around barefooted all day long on the farm. You're around cattle. You're around all the different crops. To also move into a city where it's a strange world. So, so it, it was, a, it was a, a major adjustment. That's why my dad understood that it was so different for me having come from a farm. Do you have siblings also? And, that and, and I do. And, and the one thing that I wanted to emphasize to, to, to you, Congressman, and the committee, agriculture is so important to me. It didn't matter that we were the labor on the farm. It was so important to me because it gave me a work ethic. I remember being in town, and you know, I, was, I was a big kid, pretty athletic. And I was on the football team and the basketball team, and I used to run the hurdles. And... I remember all the city kids, they go lift weights, go hang out at the swimming pool. I go back to the farm and harvest onions all summer. That'll harvest chili shape, peppers all Secretary. summer. I appreciate that. I'm just, it, it, uh, so, I know so that the chair has been lenient with the clock, or I probably would have okay. focused this a little bit more. I'd, I just As you talk about the tractor accident and your father, I just uh, happen to think that as we sit here now, there's a funeral going on for one of my neighbors and friends who was killed in a tractor accident, and I regret I'm not able to be there today. Those things do happen on the farm. It's a dangerous place to work. And I, I just, I, I'm interested in that background because it informs you in the job that you do, and I normally don't ask those kind of questions either. Um, but I noticed that uh, in both your testimony and that of Mr. Christian, uh, the word fairness comes up uh, over and over again. I mean, the effort in this GYPSA rule is to provide fairness. And so could you provide for this committee a definition of the word fairness? Well, I didn't come prepared to give you a definition for fairness. But, um, but if that's the motivator for this but, rule, that should be something well, that's pretty clear. And I can give you my perspective, not an official definition, but my perspective is that in any t type of transaction, there's two sides. 
And I just feel that fairness is where both sides are treated fairly. Okay. But you grew up on a, on, on a farm with uh, parents and siblings and all of you working together. Did you ever hear any of them say, that's not fair? And, and that was Absolutely not. You're right. Absolutely. And, and so does anyone that grew up in a family with two or more kids understand that there's no such thing as fair in a family like that? <laughs> well, again, fairness from what perspective? Well, and, and that's, that's right, and that is my point. And uh, this is um, being driven, I don't know if the President's involved, being driven by the Secretary of Agriculture, Secretary Vilsack. It's being driven by some interests out there that think they're not being treated fairly in contracts. And uh, I've been involved in a lot of contracts over the years, and I've heard people use that word fair, but it never really got us to a resolution. I see it scattered throughout the legal language in this Congress. It's scattered throughout the code of the, uh, of the U.S. Code and through the states. And uh, I will tell you, I can define the state fair. The, I, can find, I can define a county fair, but I can't, I can't define fair. And if fair is our guideline here, it is in the perspective of, the, uh, of whoever is advocating. And I'll say from, from this perspective that if you have someone who raises a uh, premium line of hogs and they go negotiate a contract to be paid that premium, and they're producing that high-quality product for a niche market, and the, and the packer is a, anticipating that load a week or whatever it is that they've agreed to do coming in, and they get paid a premium on the other end, it's not fair to say to that, to that producer and that packer that the government is going to intervene, intervene in that contract. Who can determine what's fair? Can government bureaucrats determine a contract that's, it, it can determine if a contract's fair, or does it turn into the government deciding it's not fair that someone raises a premium product and the other person doesn't, and they don't get paid the same amount? It's about the equivalent of the of 4-H giving participation ribbons instead of blue and red ribbons instead. We've got to have competition in this marketplace. And my argument would be that if people think it's not fair, why don't they get in and compete with those? What keeps them out of that marketplace? If they believe they are locked out of the market, start your own packing plant, start your own business, open your own niche market, run, run the locker plant and expand it into a franchise, come to this Congress and ask us to allow them to sell meat across state lines so that people can actually penetrate into this marketplace. I think we're on the wrong path here. I think we're on a path that, that sets up the government to be setting prices in the terms of approving or disapproving of contracts. If the variance goes outside of the government's variance, then government has to approve the contract. And what are they doing intervening themselves in between a, a producer and a packer who have two consenting adults, have reached an agreement, and now the government says, well, it's not fair to somebody else? I can tell you that as a young man, I delivered hogs to the packing plant for a fellow that I worked for, and there might be a 300-pounder in there, there might be a 160-pounder in there, and a 220-pounder in there, and a, and a pickup with a stock rack, waiting in line with with pot trailers where every hog was uniform you know uniform size and weight and easy for the packer to handle now don't we know that even if i had one hog in that in that pickup truck that was the same the same profile i'll call it of all those hogs on that pot trailer is that hog worth as much to the packer as the whole pack load or the whole truck load those are the kind of things that the government is seeking to interject themselves into and if we're going to be a free market economy then we have to let the market settle this. And I don't think government can determine fairness any more than your father, whom I know that you respect and, and hold it in high, high esteem and raise you, uh, could broker that and have all of the siblings agree that he had come down in a fair decision. I don't want the government to be the nanny state. And I just give you an opportunity to respond to what I said, and then I yield to the chairman. I will abuse my privilege here, but I'm sorry about that. Mr. Congressman, I, I appreciate your comments. They're good comments. Uh, but by the same token, I, I can't get into the detail of the proposed rule. But um, I lost my train of thought. But but anyway, th th those are good comments, and and and, and I, I appreciate this. And I've had similar conversations with uh, producers throughout the country. But um, I just I just feel that. Uh, we still need to let this process continue because we have to respect all those comments that came in. And there's comments similar to the concerns that you just expressed and the comments you just made. 
and we're going to take those into consideration as we move forward. Now, I'm going to ask if, if my partner here, our Deputy Administrator Christian, would like to expand on this. Thank you. Well, Congressman, I think, you know, the issue that you've raised is the question that a lot of people have asked us as well. The Packers and Stockyards Act has included the word unfair practices, you know, since the beginning, and a lot of people have asked what does that mean. And so I think one of the things that you saw in this proposed rule was to try to pro provide some clarity as to what an unfair practice is to help provide that guidance, you know, to the marketplace as to, to determine, okay, what is unfair and what is not. So that, that was part of the intent of the proposed rule. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Ms. Elmers. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I have a couple of questions and, um, and thank you for coming today. And actually, I would, I would like the, um, for both of you to, to weigh in um, on these. Um, and I know, I know that you have basically stated that you're not necessarily discussing some of the actual rule um, positions, basically, as it is. But I am curious, again, and I, kn I know this question has been asked already, I'm just curious about the timeline. What, you know, I know we're, you're, you are still receiving comments now. Uh, Congresswoman, no, the comment period's over. Ha, it's okay, but and the and the comments are being reviewed. Uh, absolutely, uh, Congresswoman. The, the 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 question that we receive all the time is when is this process going to end? Mm -hmm. When are we going to have a final product? And and I I appreciate that very very much. But and, and I was pleasantly surprised, or maybe not pleasantly surprised, when I came to work at USDA. I didn't realize what everyone had to go through to to go through the rulemaking process. It, this was really new to me, mm -hmm. and it was a surprise to me. But but and uh, I th I think you may have this question may have already been posed. I'm not sure. But how many people are working on this? How many USDA staff are reviewing the question, the comments, and coming up with kind of a uh, Congresswoman. I, I can't tell you exactly how many, but we have contracted outside the agency for, for, for assistance. But um, I'm not sure if you were here when, when a similar question was asked. That, you know, we received these 60,000 plus comments. Mm -hmm. okay, and then we, we uh, summarized them and we put them in a category based on how they address specific provisions of the proposed rule. And then now we're looking at, at, at alternatives and options that have been proposed, and it, it just it just takes a long time. Um, also, and and there again, um, that gives me as much information as I need. I, I do I do want to ask about the um, economic analysis the the um, of the proposed rule. Um, will that information be released? Um, my understanding is you have done um, an economic analysis. Uh, Congresswoman, in the proposed rule, there, there was an economic analysis, cost-benefit analysis, uh, and we have received uh, quite a few comments uh, on the costs. Mm -hmm. um, and as I mentioned earlier, our chief economist is leading a team is preparing a very thorough cost-benefit analysis that will be in the final, final product. Um, right now, it's really too early to to prejudge what, what the final product is going to look like. And you know, I want to emphasize to you, Congresswoman, and to the committee that uh, based on the comments, no option is going to be ignored. We're going to look mm -hmm. at any possible op option. And um, it's really too early right now in the process to, to, to one, give you a, a timeline and to tell you if we're going to, you know, what, what we're going to do with the final product mm -hmm. and if we're going to have it. Will, will you allow for public comments on that? I mean, we have, it, what, we have submitted a letter, um, many of my colleagues, myself and 146 other members um, Co Congressman, asked for this. I, 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 absolutely. I, I'm, I'm real familiar with the letter. Okay. But, but on, the, on the comments, it's, it's too early now to determine if, if we're going to have another comment period. 
because we don't really know what the final product is going to look like. Okay. Have you spoken to stakeholders about how the rule may impact their businesses? And, and if so, have you spoken to those in North Carolina? Um, Congressman, we, we haven't since um, you know, the comment period opened and now that we're uh, after the comment period trying to draft the final product, uh, we, we can't talk directly to stakeholders to tell them about what we might propose, what we might not propose. Mm -hmm. uh, however, I have spoken a lot with stakeholders. Uh, I, I, as part of my job, I've been keynote speaker at uh, sheep industry groups, cattle growers, and, and of course the, the question always comes up on the proposed rule. And I can't get into specifics with them, but one thing that I have told them, one thing that comes up all the time is, is, is uh, premiums to producers. Mm -hmm. And and that's one thing that I can say, and, and I always tell them that the Secretary and I strongly support uh, value added, we strongly support marketing arrangements, we strongly support premiums being paid to producers. I, I have one more question, and I asked the chairman if I, I know I'm about ready to run out of time here, um, if that would be all right. Um, and I'll direct this to Mr. Christian. It's, it's, it is a specific question. Um, in the proposed rule, GIPSA is attempting to overturn numerous judicial decisions by providing that a find, and I'm going to, this is a quote, finding that the challenged act or practice adversely affects or is likely to adversely affect competition is not necessary in all cases, end quote. Basically, the way that I interpret that is that the plaintiff would now not necessarily have to show actual harm when uh, challenging a packer activity. Is, is this correct? Is this um, basically the interpretation of that? Uh, that is somewhat correct. The department's longstanding position is that to prove a violation of the two sections of the Packers and Stockyards Act that apply to packers and swine contractors, that would be 202A and 202B, the unfair practice section and the unreasonable preference section, that in some cases you do not need to show competitive harm to prove a violation. An example might be if someone is fraudulently weighing your livestock at the packing plant, you as an individual packer, uh, as an individual producer, when GIPSA brings that case against the packer for weighing your livestock incorrectly, we bring that administratively for livestock and can assess a penalty and we don't have to show competitive injury. Um, so that's the, the, the department's longstanding position. There are some cases where you do have to show competitive injury, some cases of unfair practices, uh, and that may be a situation where um, a packer is um, working also as a dealer and there's um, a lack of competition in the, that practice. Uh, so th that's the, the longstanding position, and then the intent of this rule was to clarify that longstanding position. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you, Ms. Elmers. And, um, would like to thank uh, the Secretary for taking the time to be here, you as well, Mr. Christensen. If the committee members have any other questions, if you would submit them, I am sure the Secretary uh, would be happy to answer some of those. Mr. Chairman, would I, would I be allowed to just make a few maybe closing remarks? Yes, sir. Mr. Chairman, members of the, of the committee, I just wanted to, to emphasize that this administration is committed to helping small businesses, and we strongly do support transparency, fairness, and equity in the marketplace. The proposed rule that we discussed today, it's a starting point. We received over 60,000 comments, and I want everyone to know that we're listening. We're taking these comments very seriously. No option is being ruled out, and we will let these comments guide us to develop the final product. And I want to emphasize to you, Mr. Chairman of the committee, that I have spent a career working with small businesses. After leaving the farm, I uh, had the opportunity 
to work with many farmers, many ranchers, all family operations to develop markets in Mexico for cattle and sheep, to develop markets in China for pecans, to develop domestic markets in 28 different states for chili peppers and onions. So I really, really uh, feel connected to small businessmen, feel connected to farmers and ranchers. And I just want to thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, for the, all the work that you do for small business. I'd now like to yield to uh, Congressman King uh, for an introduction. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate your deference. I have a markup going on in another committee, and I'm afraid I have to slip out. But I wanted to have the opportunity to introduce um, Mr. Gary Malenke. He's a constituent of mine from Sioux Center, Iowa, and I'll say the center of the number one pork-producing congressional district in America. He's the CEO of Natural Food Holdings, which was formerly known as the Supreme Packing Company, and that's also located in Sioux Center, Iowa. Um, Gary graduated from Northwest Iowa Technical College in 1985 with an associate degree in agribusiness. After two years in the livestock and feed business and one year at Iowa Beef Packers, Gary joined Supreme Packing Company. And while at the company, he held positions starting with hog buyer, then head of, head of uh, livestock procurement and uh, community sales. And in 2001, he became the president of the company. And he's currently serving as the chairman of the North American Meat Packers Association, and his business is also an active member of the U.S. Meat Export Federation and the National Meat Association. Uh, Mr. Malenke's company is a prime example of a kind of a small packing plant that's so important to local communities, the small businesses that we've been talking about in the earlier panel. And the overall industry competitiveness is reflected by his company. It's important that we think about these businesses, Mr. Chairman, especially because these dealing with this, when they deal with specialty and niche markets, it's not just large companies. We evaluate rules and see how they affect the small companies as well. So I want to thank Mr. Malenke and the other witnesses for being here to testify today. And um, I think it's important we turn our ear. Uh, to the interests of the industry, and uh, I point out also that Mr. Malenke's company is, uh, again, from the number one pork-producing congressional district in America. I couldn't leave that commercial out, Mr. Chairman. I welcome all the witnesses. I thank you for your indulgence, and I yield back the balance of my time. Mr. Malenke, if you'd like to go ahead. Sorry. Sorry, that's better. Uh, good morning, Chairman uh, uh, Tipton and uh, Ranking Member Critz. I appreciate the, this opportunity. Um, as Congressman King said, you know, we're uh, up in Sioux Center, Iowa. Um, our firm isn't large enough to be uh, classified in the top 10 uh, hog slaughter plants, but nevertheless, we've been in business for uh, over 40 years, and uh, I've had the uh, privilege of being in the meat industry for over 20 years myself. Um, we're proud to have arrangements with a number of producers uh, to bring us hogs that fit various niche markets with whom we have marketing agreements under various brands. And to do this, we're looking for very specific uh, hogs that require growers to follow very specific protocols. Our producers are then paid a premium for meeting these expectations. And these products are then sold into markets, restaurants that differentiate our products uh, to create an enhanced value. To accomplish this, uh, uh, we work with uh, well over 500 uh, growers, uh, many of which are small family farmers. And uh, we do this to really con to produce a consistent supply of uh, product to our uh, customers. And I I'm sensitive to the, uh, the feelings in the countryside that producers aren't getting a fair deal. You know, I and my senior staff are involved in industry organizations really to give a little and to uh, to gain a lot in terms of advice and resources to better help us as business leaders. And I'm, indeed, I happen to be the uh, chairman of one of those associations uh, at this time. At a recent meeting that I attended, I visited with a young man who uh, inspired me to reach back to producers and to give back to the men and women, families who produce hogs for our business. I want these producers to know as much about fixing a fair price for pork as they do about uh, the business of raising hogs. A couple suggestions I might have uh, in ways that we can work together. A meeting consumer expectations for pork uh, at retail and or at the center of the plate is critical. Um, I and my organizations can develop um, uh, better programs to help producers better understand um, how we can work together. 
uh, working together every week of the year for the long haul and, and better share uh, and communicate with each other what it takes for these programs to be successful in meeting consumer expectations. There is already a great deal of information in the marketplace about the price for hogs and, and for pig meat. And I will agree that this can be very complicated. Um, it is not always as accessible and could, could perhaps uh, use some improvement. But nevertheless, uh, I am committed to working with the organizations I belong to to enhance transparency and information that would be useful for, to, to producers. I believe that the enhancement set forth in current legislation would also be helpful. I also know that one of the organizations in which we hold membership has been meeting with USDA's marketing officials to improve the information for specifically uh, pork price reporting. I expect these efforts uh, to be useful in improving the flow of information. I grew up on a small farm myself uh, some 30 years ago and have witnessed firsthand the changes to rural America. There is no longer a hardware store, a grocery store in small towns. Numerous school districts have merged and the economies of scale have been driven by the Walmarts of the world. This trend is not the fault of big business. It is driven by the changing consumer. Folks like Walmart have done a great job of attracting customers. Face it, thousands of people shop there every day because they choose to do so. As much as I desire to look back with nostalgia, the realities of the economic forces today are very strong. Gypsy's attempt to regulate the future by returning the way that things used to be will be a bad economic decision and will not succeed. In the summer of 2009, our business was not very good and we were not we weren't profitable. Fortunately, this year we are doing much better. And I know it is because of both domestic demand and improved exports. In 2009, the price of hogs were some 30 to 35 percent lower than in 2010, and we lost money. In 2010, we had this improved demand and we did much better because of the market conditions, and even in light of the fact that the price of the livestock was higher. And my, my, my point is really this. The primary influence of the price of livestock is the demand for the finished products we produce. It is customers coming in the door buying the product. This is a tough business. It is tough business for producers and for packers. Working together in partnership and cooperation will give us the opportunity to be successful together. I am not here to cry about the large firms. Their very largeness really denies them the flexibility that we enjoy at Natural Food Holdings. We don't need, in, we don't need GYPSA a government regulatory agency in our business plan. Enhancing our partnerships with producers for the mutual benefit is a much better solution. And I thank you for allowing me to testify. And I would be happy to take any questions. Great. Thank you, Mr. Malenke. And um, as a reminder, you did great. Uh, just in terms of the lights uh, that we have, you will have five minutes for your testimony. And when it gets down to the final minute, uh, the yellow light will come on and then the red light. And if you could summarize uh, after that. Uh, I would also uh, like to have and have the privilege of uh, introducing one of my constituents, Ms. Robbie Lavalley from uh, Hotchkiss, Colorado. And I'm sorry the Secretary left because we could talk about Tulia and Hotchkiss uh, for some communities. A lot of folks don't know where they're at. Uh, but Ms. Lavalley is a beef producer who is past president of the Colorado Cattlemen's Association and a board member of the National Cattlemen's Beef Association. Uh, she received her bachelor's and master of science in animal science from Colorado State University. Uh, I would certainly like to thank you, Robbie, for being here and taking the time to be here and look forward to your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, Ranking Member Critz. My name is Robbie Lavalley, and I have been a beef producer all of my life, and my two boys represent the fourth generation on our ranch. In addition to our ranch, my family and I are co-owners of Homestead Meats, a direct beef marketing business that has been in operation since 1995. There are six ranching families who co-own this small business, and we have 13 full-time employees. To enhance our direct marketing beef business, Homestead Meats owns and operates a packing plant regulated by USDA. Therefore, we are producers, feeders, and packers. The proposed GYPSA rule will significantly hinder our small business model, cripple our ability to market our cattle the way we want, and limit consumer choices. As I said, 
I am a producer on the cow-calf side, and our business is built on relationships and alliances throughout the beef chain. For years, we have successfully marketed our calves through an alliance with a packer. That alliance has created a relationship that provides feedback from the packer on the quality of our cattle, quality for which we get paid a premium for. I strongly believe in the fundamental American business tenet of a willing seller and a willing buyer, being able to enter into a private business transaction because it protects my pricing and marketing mechanism. Our cattle marketing contracts are the heart of our small business, the incentive to manage for the future, and the stability for our banking partner. And it does not warrant being posted on the Internet or receiving additional government intervention and oversight or being subject to potential litigation. When the proposed rule bans packer-to-packer -packer sales, the six families and homestead meets may not be able to sell to other packers. This will substantially reduce the profitability for the rest of our cattle and compromises the alliance we have spent years building. This is a great example of how this rule truly harms producers and processors across the country. For years, USDA has promoted exactly what we are doing, sell direct to the consumer, operate as a small processor in a strategic area of the country, being rewarded for adding value to the end product and producing local food. We responded to consumer demand. We followed USDA's lead. Now we are being punished. This is a slap in the face to innovative businessmen and women across the U.S. The proposed GYPSA rule offers neither clarity nor clear definition in terminology. Elimination of the competitive injury requirement will provide a disincentive for packer premiums and value-added contracts because of the fear of litigation. The vague definitions such as unfair or reasonable person will open the door to an increased number of lawsuits because mere accusations without economic proof suffice for USDA or an individual to bring a lawsuit against a buyer. Who determines fairness? Does increased government intervention and litigation determine fairness? Arbitrary judgment by GYPSA will only increase paperwork and costs for small business owners like me. Who pays for this increased intervention and litigation? The beef cattle industry does. When cost increase for the packer, the trickle-down effect is to decrease the price paid to ranchers. This will be a trial lawyer's dream and will devastate small businesses such as mine. What will be the consequence when the cost of defending prices paid for my cattle and complying with this rule add to the operating cost? What happens to every other industry when litigation increases? No one takes a risk or sticks their neck out or pays a premium for fear of reprisal. This ends creativity, partnerships, and the desire to take a chance, which is the very basis of the entrepreneurial spirit of the American small business owner. Do we truly want that for the beef industry? The rule will require buyers of my cattle to justify paying a premium for my livestock. What will be the standard for that justification? Who will set it? One size does not fit all. The regulation seems to infer that it is the role of big government and I strongly oppose the government setting or justifying the premiums paid. This will roll back the clock 30 years and take us back to commodity beef, which consumers have told us they don't want. Value-based marketing has given our family business the opportunity to compete for market share at the highest level. As a result, we have been able to build a small business that supports the local economy and provide consumers with the products they want. We do not need big government setting up shop on our farms and ranches and government intrusion into the private marketplace is not the answer. I urge the committee to help stop this rule from being finalized, as it is detrimental to ranchers, consumers, and the entire U.S. economy. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, we have Mr. Joel Brandenberger, President of the National, uh, National Turkey Federation. Uh, Mr. Brandenberger uh, joined NTF in 1991 as the Federation's Director of Public Affairs and served in a variety of positions most recently as Senior Vice President for Legislative Affairs uh, before being appointed to his current post in December of 2006. Uh, thank you for being here today, Mr. Brandenberger. Thank you, Chairman Tipton, Ranking Member Critz, members of the subcommittee. 
the National Turkey Federation represents all segments of the turkey industry, including growers, processors, breeders, hatchery owners, and allied industry. NTF appreciates the opportunity to testify because our members believe GIPS's proposed marketing rule will harm the many small businesses that play a vital role in producing more than 5 billion pounds of ready-to-cook turkey meat in the United States. A decade ago, our leadership recognized the need to develop comprehensive policy on legislation and regulation that could affect the grower-processor relationship. We formed a special committee of growers and processors that spent six months developing policy that was unanimously approved by our Board of Directors. The policy calls on NTF to support legislation or regulation that helps all parties better understand the nature of the contract they are entering into. We supported the 2009 GIPSA rule that enhanced transparency in contracts and permitted growers to discuss a proposed contract with financial and legal advisors as well as business partners. But NTF strongly objects to any proposed law or rule that would insert the government into the negotiating process by dictating specific terms of compensation or excessively limiting the ability of either party to manage their financial risk. Our members believe this is exactly what the current GIPSA rule would do. The rule fails to grasp the diversity of today's turkey industry. Turkeys are processed by family-owned companies, grow-owned cooperatives, and large, diversified international companies. Ten of the 25 turkey processors in this country meet SBA's definition of a small business. But small business plays a bigger role in the industry as well. A significant percentage of the more than 8,000 family farms that raise turkeys are, in fact, small businesses employing staffs in some cases as large as 250 people. Some of these family-owned small businesses are also part of the seven grower-owned cooperatives that produce turkey in this country. All of them understand the critical importance of maintaining a strong business relationship between growers and processors. About 80 percent of the turkeys today are produced under the traditional production contract, where the company owns the turkeys, provides the feed, the veterinary care, and the grower provides the housing and their expertise. Another 10 percent are produced under marketing contracts, where the grower owns the birds, provides the feed, the veterinary care, as well as the housing and expertise, and sells to the processor at a previously contracted price. In both of those cases, growers' compensation can vary according to specific terms in the contract. The remaining 10 percent of turkeys are raised on company-owned farms. I want to highlight three aspects of the rule that create enormous potential problem for today's industry. The first is the competitive injury provision that has been talked about quite a bit here. The second is the provision that would require processors to virtually guarantee a grower can recoup 80 percent of their capital investments. And the third is a series of provisions, which the previous witness discussed, that would discourage competitive contracts and reduce the premiums um, or deductions that growers can receive based on the performance of the birds in their care. Taken together, these provisions create significant new legal and regulatory risk for turkey processors. And as processors seek to manage that risk, there could be serious unintended consequences. The most obvious is that contracts will become less competitive and compensation more uniform. Those farmers, large and small, who are doing an outstanding job in receiving premiums will justifiably, be, justifiably feel cheated as a new regulation forces everyone to a lower common denominator. The bigger impact may come later. As processors seek to minimize their risk, one conceivable option would be to grow more turkeys on fewer farms, eliminating production on all or eliminating or reducing production on all but the best performing farms. Processors could also increase the number of turkeys grown on company-owned farms. An excellent example of unintended consequences comes from a grower member who testified last week before the Senate Agriculture Committee. His family farm is one of 16 that owns a processing cooperative in the upper Midwest. This co-op is hoping to expand over the next few years. Some of the expansion can be covered by increasing the number of turkeys grown on the existing farms. But ultimately, they believe that contracting with other farmers may be the, met, may be the only route they have to the expansion they envision. They have said if this rule takes effect, they believe the risk will be too large and it will limit, limit their expansion. So the irony in this is rich. We have growers who feel that a rule allegedly designed to empower them will, in fact, ultimately stifle their ability to grow and create new jobs. What is especially frustrating is what has been discussed here already at length. USDA promulgate, proposed this rule without conducting an adequate assessment of its economic impact. A study funded by NTF found an economic impact of $360 million to the industry to our industry alone. Others have shown impacts in other industries as large as $1 billion over five years and a $14 billion reduction in the gross domestic product. USDA now has agreed to an economic assessment, as we have heard, but as we have also heard, there is no commitment yet to uh, open it for comment after it is completed. 
in order for there to be any level of confidence that this final rule really is going to promote the best interest of family farmers and their small businesses, it is essential that this economic analysis be submitted for public comment before the rule is finalized. Thank you again for the opportunity to be here. We have to look forward to answering your questions. Thank you, sir. Uh, I'd like to yield now to uh, Ranking Member Kritz to introduce our next witness. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's my pleasure to introduce, introduce Mr. Bob Junk. Mr. Junk is the Local Economy Manager for FAPEN Economic Development Council, a nonprofit organization aimed at increasing jobs and quality of life in Fayette County, Pennsylvania, which ranks usually either the second or third or first poorest county in Pennsylvania. As a local economy manager, he develops marketing plans to bring awareness to surrounding farms and build regional business networks. Bob has a degree in business agriculture from Penn State University and has extensive experience with farm operations. Once owned a 10-acre strawberry farm with 15 employees and has managed a large dairy operation in Uniontown. Uh, Mr. Junk also has 40-plus years of working on sustainable farm policy at the state and federal level. He has served as the state president of the Pennsylvania Farmers Union for 10 years and has served on numerous committees and board, boards representing the interests of fault, small farmers. Welcome, Mr. Junk. Thank you very much, uh, Congressman Critz, and it is my honor to be here today. And I thank the opportunity to bring testimony here in support of the Gypsum's proposed, proposed rules. Um, uh, Chairman Tipton, Ranking Member Critz, and Subcommittee members, uh, my name is Bob Junk. Uh, as the Congressman uh, mentioned, I am the Local Economy Manager for FAPEN Economic Development Council. Uh, I am going to summarize my testimony in lieu of time uh, because there is no way I, I know uh, because of all the issues that we are supporting um, and that these proposed rules are addressing. Um, so. I, I would like to start out, though, by uh, stating that our mission uh, at Fay Penn is to maintain and increase employment opportunities slash jobs in Fayette County in an effort to improve the quality of life for all of its residents. And again, it is all of our residents that we are, are focused on. And agriculture is a main part of our local economy. And uh, so with that, um, today, we have heard a lot of information and a lot of numbers thrown around. And I would really like to start out with the fact that to date we have lost 1.5 million beef and hog producers over the last 30 years. So I think we have a problem when we are looking at losing that many producers that are small business owners uh, out of our local economy. They are reinvesting those dollars locally. They are creating the opportunity for small business entrepreneurs. Uh, they are also creating the opportunity for local reinvestment into the neighborhoods, communities, and also into um, our public schools and, and so on. So with that, um, you know, we talked a lot about regulation, government, you know, we don't want big government. Um, but when we take a look at really what the GIPSA rules are geared to, and we could go right back to the Farm Bill, and it was a directive through the Farm Bill, um, and we all had an opportunity to debate and negotiate and vote on the Farm Bill, which was uh, approved three years ago, that um, this regulation is to be looked at to look how we can bring balance to the market for the producers. Uh, for many, many years, producers have been faced with a number of challenges. Uh, being a producer uh, a number of years ago, those challenges have not changed much. Um, I'm from a small rural community. Uh, we have lost a lot of our stockyards, our local packers, because of consolidation and mergers and has created even more of a hindrance to get access. But what I'm going to talk about a little bit right now at this point in time is, is the fact that um, a lot of our producers today are being forced to do certain upgrades uh, to their operations to be able to uh, receive contracts. Uh, and a lot of times these contracts, and especially in poultry, 
uh, are only six to eight weeks long. But at the same time, they're forced into taking a 30-year mortgage to be able to uh, do these upgrades. Um, knowing that, again, uh, farmers have limited ability to access credit, um, and they are uh, not usually able to access the same type of credit that normal small business operations have or businesses, um, they're sometimes forced into taking alternative uh, credit measures. And it forces them to be then uh, relying on hopefully getting new contracts. This proposal will actually give the producers uh, some compensation if the, uh, as long as they uh, continue to meet those obligations with the uh, processors. Contract terminations, um, we have a serious problem with uh, processors being able to just eliminate contracts with producers. Uh, this proposal would give the opportunity for those producers to capture at least 80 percent of their investment from those uh, individuals uh, or the, and those processors. Um, the other issue I'd like to talk about, and it's really key, is um, the issue of the ranking payment system in base of, of, of assumption that all growers are provided comparable inputs and vari varieties of performance in as a result in farm management. Um, a lot of times what will happen today is farmers uh, are just there for the management and, and the building, as you heard in previous hearing or previous uh, witness, and they are carrying the risks. And there is really no way of them being able to uh, make that relationship to what they are being paid and how they can just uh, uh, truly balance uh, the the uh, the price that they are actually being repa being paid by those companies, um, and then the other issue I'd, I'd like to also bring up is the uh, in relationship to that, um, the company can still pay bonuses on top of the the uh, what they pay to the producers. This does not restrict them from being able to pay premiums to performance. This is not uh, in any way restricting niche markets to be able to pay a farmer for any of, of the added uh, premiums that again can be passed on or that the consumers are requiring or requesting from the marketplace. I want to make that perfectly clear that there is no restriction from that. With that, I want to thank you for the opportunity to testify here, and uh, I will be ready for any questions. Thank you. <coughs> Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, we will now begin our questioning, and uh, I would like to start with Ms. LaValle. Uh, under the proposed rule with packer-to-packer -packer affiliates, uh, there would be a ban in terms of the selling. In your case, uh, that would be very problematic, obviously, uh, since you have a producer-owned packaging plant uh, and also produce livestock. Therefore, you wouldn't be able to sell livestock to your own packing plant. Uh, what would that mean for your business? Well, we could, we could continue to sell to our own packing plant. We just, our six families uh, market about a third of the cattle to, through the homestead meats, through the pack, packing plant that we own. But what it would hinder is our ability to sell to another packer. Mm -hmm. That's what it would hinder. So our other two-thirds uh, of all the families, of the six families, would then be restricted in who they could market their cattle to. It takes buyers out of the market. And again, that would be a detriment to producers across the, across the economy, especially us and other uh, packing cooperatives, uh, uh, premium beef, organ country beef, all of those that are in a similar situation. You know, uh, you mentioned in, in your testimony that this is going to create new paperwork and increase costs. Do you have any idea of how much this is going to increase your costs? When we have looked at the proposed regulation, Again, we have 13 employees. Now, that does not consider all the, the six families, and uh, certainly that's a, that's a great question. We have not done an in-depth analysis to say that it was going to cost us another $2 a hundredweight or anything like that. We do know that it would take another half-time person to comply with this uh, regulation. That's approximately uh, you know, $30,000 to $40,000 additional to our operating cost for our packing plant. And we only, again, uh, have 13 employees to begin with. So you are a wealthy small business. You can afford that, surely? 
We operate on a pretty slim margin. I know you do. <laughs> so, um, you know, as you pointed out in your uh, testimony, Ms. Lavallee, um, that for years the Federal Government has pushed farmers and livestock operators to become more actively involved in value-added downstream economic activities uh, as a means of being extreme. Uh, it seems to be problematic since you are a producer-owned packing plant and also produce livestock. Uh, really, when sorry, I got lost on my, my paper here. In terms of uh, going downstream, uh, are you going to be able to maximize the value of your business? Is this going to be hitting you in the pocketbook and, and possibly creating job loss for you if this rule goes through? Again, when I look uh, at the in-depth an analysis of, of this proposed regulation, and uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I look at the unintended consequences, and I don't you know, yes, it has an impact on our business. Yes, it has an impact on our six families and our six ranches. But it also has a huge impact on the, the beef industry across the, whether it's just our area or across the country. Again, increased uh, government intervention, increased potential litigation. Mm -hmm. All of these factors have a trickle-down effect to where there is a reduction in the price and an increase in the operating cost. And again, in this uh, era of very slim margin, increased cost and decreased revenue is never good for any producer of any size, whether it's small, medium, or large. Great. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Malenke, you mentioned in your testimony that you have arrangements with a number of producers uh, that raise hogs for niche markets, uh, which requires producers to follow a very specific growing protocol. Uh, if the GIPSA rule is implemented as written, uh, do you feel that an incentive exists for these producers to undertake the added expense uh, in following these protocols and if they aren't guaranteed a premium for the, uh, the added value? You know, c clearly these growers aren't going to raise pigs with the protocol that really ultimately these consumers have set forth. In other words, it's the consumer saying, hey, th this is what we want and this is why we want it. So it's, it's flowing backwards. And if, if they're not assured of uh, a premium, th they simply won't do it. Uh, do you feel that by guaranteeing every producer a base pay that the quality of livestock uh, available to consumers that will decrease? Is that what I'm hearing? I, I believe it would be that case, definitely. Great. Uh, Mr. Brandenberger, uh, you mentioned in your testimony a provision in the proposed rule that would allow a grower to recover uh, 80 percent of the cost of the required capital investment. Uh, do you think that given the margins, small uh, integrators may find it difficult to make such assurances? I think that is a potential problem. I mean, in reality, in the overwhelming majority of the cases, that, that investment in our industry at least is going to be recouped and then some. It is going to happen. Uh, usually for new growers, fairly long-term contracts are offered. We have relatively small turnover rates among our growers. It is the problem of once you put that risk in writing on, you know, on the line, you assume that risk by guaranteeing it, in essence, that is part of your contracts. How do the lenders? You know, how do the fin how, how do the people that help finance the companies in our industry? How are they going to look at that? How is that going to affect their ability, their willingness to make some investments that are going to be important? And for our companies, at that point, if you're going to offer these guarantees in writing, that's part of your business obligation. Which growers are you going to choose to do that with? And do you start making some very hard decisions that that may affect some growers whose performance is far from poor, but who may not meet? the criteria necessary to survive in this, in this new higher risk world. So it will impact smaller growers? Smaller growers or, yeah, and growers that, um, you know, for whom the investment, um, for whom the investment might be a bigger stretch uh, and may have a little bit larger risk because of, you know, because of a variety of factors. Yes. Okay. That is what concerns growers a little bit is what is going to happen when my contract's renewed, they want to make this investment. If this is a guarantee, where am I going to fall in that new world? Okay. Great. Uh, and Mr. Junk, in your testimony, uh, it indicates that you agree with uh, GIPS and their proposal to remove the tournament pay system for poultry contractors. Uh, smaller growers raise their flocks to meet certain requirements using different diet formulas and creating a niche market for their unique birds. Uh, if the growers know that they are going to be receiving the same base pay as other, another grower who doesn't follow the same requirements, 
these birds that could be of a lesser quality. Where is the incentive for growers to continue to grow and produce uh, these consumer driven birds? Well, like I was saying, number one, they can. Want to hit your well. microphone, please? Thanks. Well, first off, um, the contractors can still pay premiums and uh, for better quality or better performing animals. I'm sorry, I just lost my train of thought. Um, but could you, could you repeat the last part of that question that you asked? Yeah, uh, what it is, what, what, where is the incentive for growers to continue to produce the consumer driven birds? Well, right now, as far as the small producers, because I think you were making a relationship to the smaller producers at the same time, right now the smaller producer doesn't have uh, a lot of options in the first place because he's already being penalized. Uh, secondly, the uh, in, in the poultry industry, most of the birds and the feed in, uh, is already owned by the uh, contractor. Um, the farmers basically providing the the building which the birds are housed in. But they're all receiving the same base pay. Going off. Yes, mm -hmm. and and so what I'm trying to do is to defend or define uh, why we're supporting a base pay structure uh, versus. Uh, you know, whatever the contractor wants to pay. It's a, I mean, the bottom line right now, it's a, it's a take it or leave it uh, contract. Uh, if you, as the poultry grower, is sitting there with a 30 year mortgage after you made the improvements, and then all of a sudden you're sitting there saying, okay, um, it's time to renew the contract, and here's what we're going to pay for the birds, is, or for your production on, on the birds, um, but you don't have the opportunity to negotiate the price, who's setting the market then? And that comes back to, you know, what is the real value of that bird? And what is, and how does the producer have the opportunity to determine that without being able to negotiate with that uh, contractor in a good, faithful way? Um, any other contracts, we have the opportunities to, uh, if we feel, feel that we've been un, you know, unduly justed as far as fairness or whatnot, the ability to negotiate or... or Do you see, I, I guess the point I'm trying to get at is, is where you have the same base pay uh, that's going to be uh, put into place. Uh, I'm, I'm having a hard time really understanding that distinction. Uh, shouldn't, shouldn't there be... There's still value to that bird. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just like in the cattle industry. I may have a different size hog or, diff or a, uh, a heavier hog versus a, an ideal hog. Uh, I, ha I could have a steer that is the ideal weight and the ideal size, and it might be the ideal breed that doesn't have the big bone that where you're going to have a lot of waste. Um, but that animal is still valued at the same base price. It's, it's at the same starting number. Whatever, you know, it's still there. It's, it still has that value. That's what we're trying to say is, is make it more balanced on that base price. If it's a higher quality animal, pay the premium. Nobody's saying that they can't. But we want to know, as a grower, what is that base price going to be when we're starting to enter into these contracts? Mm -hmm. you know, and then it should not be pending one producer against another producer. Okay. M Mr. Brandenberger, do you have some comments, maybe? Well, uh, there's one thing that, that, that's mentioned a lot, and, and, and I know Mr. Junk hears it from a lot from the people he talks to, is the question of inputs. And, and there's, you sometimes hear talk about there or the Pults, which are our baby turkeys or, or, or chicks that they receive of varying qualities. Now, a live animal isn't something you can rubber stamp, but in the turkey in the industry at least, an important thing to know is that the genetic lines are managed almost entirely by two primary breeders that operate in the United States. They're the ones that produce the genetic lines that the processors use. They spend tens of millions of dollars to create as much uniformity between each poult that's delivered as do the hatchery owners. Who, who hatch the poults and get them out there. Their businesses suffer if the processors start seeing that any percentage of these poults are substandard, aren't performing. And, and there's no percentage in, in sending substandard poults onto any farm because with the high feed costs we have today, and we could talk about other government policies, but we'll let it go for this point, with the high feed costs we have today, you know, no processor is going to continue buying and sourcing poults and sending them to growers if they're not getting maximum feed efficiency off of that bird. So there's already an enormous economic disincentive for any substandard poult to be delivered to any farm with any degree of regularity. Okay. Great. Uh, 
just follow up uh, one other question there, Mr. Junk. In terms of your organization, do you have any fears that the competitive injury provisions in the rule, uh, along with provisions banning the use of tournament systems to rank growers and the requirements that growers recoup their investment in new barns and housing, will lead to some processors uh, restricting all their future contract buying only to the most successful growers uh, or even doing all of their own growing in-house? Uh, reducing the number of opportunities for other growers, including beginning growers. You, when you, the, was you saying fares? Yeah, no. When we're talking about the competitive injury provisions in the rule, okay, uh, is this going to be restricting some of these opportunities for growers to be able to develop uh, and actually closing down the market? Uh, I, myself personally, no. I don't think it will. Um, if anything, it gives the again the producers. Uh, the opportunity to uh, have an opportunity to identify and be able to access justice for for their their probable cause mm -hmm. and so no, I do not see this causing any problems within the industry uh, as far as the producers for the again for the last uh, you know i uh, I was president of Pennsylvania farmers Union uh, back in the late eighties and nineties. And these are some of the same problems that we had back then that we have been trying to address and bring uh, concerns to. The consolidation of the industry today has been growing bigger and bigger. And our concern is, is no different than any other, other industry's concern. When does it get too big to fail? And right now what we are looking at is make sure we have a fair, balanced uh, opportunity to access the market and provide competitive pricing. Okay, thank you. Um, I'd like now to yield to Ranking Member Kritz for his questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And in, in, in the uh, uh, in because of uh, time is running short, I actually only have one question, but I, I do have a, a, a second question that that came to light because I I'm not sure if it was you, Mr. Malenke, or, or you, Mrs. Lavalley, that talked about. A one size fits all, and uh, what we do at the federal level, we do two things very well: one size fits all, and two mandate. Um, we do a lot of mandating and push it down to states, who then have to figure out how to pay for it. Um, but you, you talked about the packer to packer sales, and I and I understand um, in reading through the the ruling or or not the ruling, but the, what they're talking about is that I guess there's. A possibility that packer to packer sales is being used to affect prices, and that's why they're they're talking about it. But um, I'm curious if there is a solution where it can protect against using packer to packer sales to influence pricing and not impact what you're doing, which is at a smaller level. I mean, is there a way that maybe at a size, if the rule said, well, we're gonna we're gonna exempt smaller packers from this rule, or is there something that you see as a possible issue or a, a possible solution, either, bo both or either one of you? Start. Um, j just from the pork side, uh, today the pork industry operates under mandatory reporting of live animals. And packer-to-packer -packer sales are reported there, but they are in a separate bucket. So in other words, they are uh, clearly defined uh, separate from other livestock. Okay. Okay. And, and, you know, my, my, my experience as a packer buying hogs from another packer is, hey, the only reason I bought them was because it was uh, the most attractive uh, deal I could get, Right. Um, purely a, a pure business decision. Okay. And again, uh, similar for uh, beef, one size fits all, again, does not take into account the inherent variation across uh, whether you are Utah or Colorado or, or the East. It doesn't take in that inerrant variation or the significant difference, uh, the significant miles between markets, uh, all of that, the, the weight variation, the different environments, the operating, all of that. So uh, to say that we could make a size threshold and, again, try to uh, put that on an industry will have the same trickle-down effect of, of decreasing the actual price paid to, to the rancher, as you have mentioned earlier, that is the, the person at the bottom of the, of the ladder. Uh, and all the way up through the through the beef chain. So, you know, similar to the pork as far as the reporting, uh, size threshold uh, would have a similar impact of, of ratcheting down the price paid. Okay. 
Uh, well, that's what it, and I mean, I'm, I'm showing my lack of knowledge of about your industries, and I, that's why I'm trying to learn this so that you know we can work together to come up with a, a stand a stand when we're talking to USDA about what is a best way forward and what what our stand is going to be. Now, uh, Mr. Malenki, you made a comment about Walmart um, being successful. Now, I so you know where I stand. Uh, I'm not. Uh, uh, I don't buy into the Walmart model because, and I'm going to give you a very specific example, is that there have been several times where my wife has gone to Walmart because I live in a rural part of Pennsylvania and there's no other stores left. They've driven pretty much everyone else out of business. So you go to Walmart, she goes to buy the thing that she wants, and Walmart doesn't carry it anymore because they have demanded a price from the producer and the producer can't meet that price, so they drop them from their shelves. So I have just a little bit of heartburn about how that operates. I think you're limiting your choices. The other hat I wear in this Congress is I'm on the Armed Services Committee, and we've seen a consolidation of industry. And consolidation is not always good, because if you have a problem, if you only have one company or two companies are doing it, you've got some issues. So. I'm, you, so you know where I stand in, in, in the question I'm going to come up with is that um, many times what happens to congressmen is people come into our offices and say, we've got a problem, you need to fix it. So then we push back, and that's what happened with this farm bill and with GIPSA is that people were coming in saying there's a problem. So I'm going to ask every one of you to answer this, and we'll go right, your left to right, my right to left, as what do you think, what drove this ruling or this for this gyp, revisiting of this gypsa rule what do you think caused that is it just belly aching by some small farmers and that enough people it gained some steam is there a real issue out there and if this revision isn't the answer do you have any ideas or i'm sure your your industries have sent comments in 60,000 comments obviously you know producers and the industry has come in, what do you think the solution might be, or do you think there really isn't a problem and that we should just leave it as is? And that's my only question, Mr. Chairman. So, Ms. Mrs. LaValle, if you would start, and then we'll just work across. Thank you, Mr. Critz. You bring up a, an interesting question, and it's a question that uh, we as uh, have thought about. Uh, you heard over and over that the, the age on this rule and that the industry has evolved. When you look at the proposed regulation, though, and you look back at what you uh, put forward in the 2008 Farm Bill, this regulation has overreach, and it has went beyond the 2008 Farm Bill. And so, again, the unintended consequences, the not having the clear economic analysis that has been uh, fully vetted and looked at uh, by USDA, and I know that they said they are continuing to work I'm, on I'm it. just going to interrupt you for once. I, I don't want to know what you think about what USDA is doing. What I want to know is, do you think there is an issue, and is there something that USDA should be doing to address it? In, again, it, as I was starting to say, when you look at the unintended consequences of this proposed regulation, this does not address, this does not put more ranchers back in rural America. This does not put more sale barns back in small towns. So, no, this regulation, this proposed regulation does not take us where they want us to be. And, no, this regulation should be shelved. Back to, go back to the 2008. But this regulation should be shelved. You know, I, I don't believe that uh, um, you know, the, the issue comes down to economics. You know, as, as I mentioned in my testimony, I mean, I grew up on a small farm. I, I love the small farm atmosphere, et cetera, but the forces of economics are simply against smallness. You know, smallness, you, you literally have to differentiate yourself in order to be competitive because the, you know, like I say, those economic forces are huge. And Face it, that's the way the world has become, you know, and I, I used Walmart as that example. You know, is there anything USDA can really do about it? I don't know. I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know what it would be. Um, you know, encouraging producers to 
uh, differentiate themselves, get into different markets, or, you know, you have to, you know, what's the old saying, if you can't uh, beat them, you got to join them. Um, not great choices in some cases. I fully understand and I, and I sympathize for, for those that are faced with those decisions, but um, that's, that's the world we are in. It is, good, it is a very good question, and I would say a couple of things. One, in any business relationship, you know, it is not always going to be smooth sailing. Uh, you know, I have got three people who work for me in here, and they might not always say the best things about me. You know, there are concerns, there are grumbles that, that occur from time to time. But in our industry, it would be hard to see how the growers would feel that they don't have an opportunity for empowerment. Four of the last five new business entities to enter the processing in the turkey industry have been grower-owned cooperatives. They have been able to empower themselves. In fact, two of them would tell you the biggest problem they had was the paperwork at USDA to get a loan guarantee that they needed for their financing. Uh, another situation in your home state, about five or six years ago, a group of growers weren't happy with the deal they had from the processor closest to them. They find, formed a cooperative. They decided not to go into the processing into the business, but with this cooperative, they went to a processor in another state, which was still close enough to, for the transportation to make sense, and cut a better deal for themselves. I think they felt very empowered by what they were, what they were able to do for themselves as a group. So, you know, in terms of what we'd recommend about where the rule of reached, I think if GIPS has started just by going back and adhering more closely to what was in the last farm bill, that would probably be, you know, an important step forward. Um. Of course, you know I I I, I support uh, the proposed rules, um, and I support uh, moving on moving forward into the process. Uh, we all know that there's been over 60 some thousand comments being made, and we don't know what those all those comments mean and how USDA is going to respond to it. So right now we're 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 commenting on a proposed rule that is not a final rule. And, and we believe that in order to really see what uh, USDA is really going to uh, implement it, it, without going to the final rule, part of that, that procedure, we don't know. Uh, we, uh, when I say we, we're members of NSAC, of, uh, uh, developed a letter and sent to each of, you, uh, each of the members, and it's attached to my testimony of of an additional 143 other organizations from all over the country uh, supporting moving this into the next uh, level, um, because we don't know what the actual outcome is going to be here. Uh, yeah, we had comments. We submitted comments also. Uh, so we don't know what, what those comments, what comments are going to get picked up, what's not going to be picked up. Also, Farm Bureau, American Farm Bureau, National Farmers Union, both have submitted letters are saying let's take it to the uh, to the final rulemaking. Let's see what what the you know just to throw the baby out with the bathwater at this point in time. The farm bill directed it. Both the um, president, the Senate, and the House, all three of those chambers approved the farm bill. It's in the farm bill, and this this was approved under the Bush administration. So let's let's finish it out. Let's get the final rule out and let's see what what actually is going to be the end result. A lot of these comments, 60,000 comments, is coming from producers. It is coming from producer groups. It is coming from co-ops. It is coming from farm, general farm organizations. It is coming from processors. So let us take it to the next level. Let us continue the process and let us see what the final rules are going to be, look, are, are going to be like. Well, thank you very much. I, I appreciate, and that's what I mean. This is all about perspective, and I appreciate uh, you offering that. And uh, with that, I yield back. Uh, thank you. I'd now like to recognize uh, Ms. Elmers. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and and thank our panelists um, for being here today and and discussing this very important issue, um, Mr. Um, Malenki. I have a, I have a question for you um, in regard. Um, to the USDA, the rule, basically, um, and the approval of the contract terms after a sale has actually been um, completed. And I'm wondering if you have concerns in relation to that. Um, obviously, that, that puts a little more cost and, and uh, 
uh, difficulty to you um, because you're having to deal with that up front. Um, do you think that there may be a chance that Packers will withhold part of their contract payment until they get the, the contract approved by USDA? Is that a possibility, or what are your thoughts on you know, that? We're regulated under Packers and Stockyards today to make payments within 24 hours or the next mm -hmm. business day. Okay, mm -hmm. you know how Packers may look at those contracts in the future. Uh, you know, it, it's a little hard to tell. Mm -hmm. I mean, if, face it, uh, I, I can only assume that they're not going to want to take on extra burden or feel right. as if, gee, I, you know, have this potential bullseye after me because of now I'm in this contract. So. Mm -hmm. There may likely be incentive to do less contracting. Mm -hmm. If, if, if we, uh, some of the the por portion of the payment was withheld, held, what would that do to your business and your cash flow? Well, obviously, I don't own the livestock. Mm -hmm. I'm paying for the livestock, mm -hmm. and you know, face it, uh, paying for it within 24 hours of. Of, of from the time of delivery or from the time of processing, um, my money turns really, really fast. Mm -hmm. um, so, it would just extend everything out. Well, basically, I'd get to use someone else's cash, which I don't mm -hmm. think that's. I don't really think that's the in, the intent. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Well, thank you, and um, Mr. Junk, I, I have a question for you too. Um, you state in your testimony that the GIPSA proposed rule will also help hog producers. Um, can you elaborate on that further? Um, how, how do you feel in particular um, that this, this will help our, our hog farmers? Well, it, it, part of it is under the ranking. Uh, it'll give them uh, also the opportunity to um, be able to uh, get a base price and, and, and out of the market or out of the off of the um, sorry out of the uh, contractor um, the other issue would also give them the opportunity to be able to if they feel that they've not been treated right within the contract uh, the ability to be able to go to litigation mm -hmm. and be able to uh, have an opportunity to have a a uh, trial by jury uh, hearing mm -hmm. if uh, so desired do you do you feel that the hog producers will benefit from every provision that's being put forward um, in the proposed rule that has the effects on all of the swine industry? Uh, I, I don't think across the board um, different provisions will have different impacts in different uh, uh, livestock segments. Um, so um, all the provisions that are being proposed, will they have an impact in the hog production or a hog producer? No. Mm -hmm. um, but um, will there be some benefits? Yes. So what, what would what would you say in your assessment would be some of the negative effects that might might occur? Uh, negative, I couldn't honestly tell you at this point in time. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back the rest of my time. Thank you, Congressman Elmers. Um, and I'd like to thank all of you for taking the time to be able to participate today. Uh, as this subcommittee continues to focus on burdensome regulations that affect small businesses, I would like to once again encourage the USDA to take into consideration all of the testimony and questions that we have heard here today as they work through their economic analysis. I would also like to encourage the USDA to revise their analysis on small businesses as part of the more detailed economic analysis currently underway. After that, the USDA should publish the new regulatory flexibility analysis for comment to ensure small businesses that they can uh, have input and can inform the agency on its effects on their businesses. Again, thanks to all of our witnesses for being here today, and I ask unanimous consent that members have five legislative days to submit statements in 